kids say that was so two year, two years ago. They probably say it was so two minutes ago. But uh, that was the past. Uh, this is what we just experienced. And, uh, you know, I remember talking to the CTA Retirement Committee last uh, January and telling them it just can't keep going up like it is. And sure enough, about four days later, it cracked and, and went back down. We thought the February low would hold when it hit it again in March. Uh, but to our surprise, March just kind of climbed its way up. I have to say in June, about halfway through that chart, we started to get much more defensive uh, and take profits out of the U.S. equity market. Um, and that's part of the nature of our job. You do that, and then you find out by August you're wrong. Uh, that was a stupid move because the market actually traded higher, only by about 3%. Uh, but then, boy, uh, uh, September started, and boom, the markets broke down, and so suddenly June selling in June was a smart idea. Um, the end of that graph is what's so painful. That was the worst December uh, on record, uh, as in ever. Um, uh, the Christmas Day sell -off, Christmas Eve sell-off of 600 points uh, still to this day utterly baffles me. Uh, you know, there's a lack of traders. There's a half-day market close on Christmas Eve. The mood is usually slightly optimistic because, goodness, the next day is a holiday. And yet the machines took off and the selling begets selling begets selling. And lo and behold, we dropped 600 points just uh, like a dagger. Um, the market rebounded very quickly after that on Boxing Day, the day after Christmas. Um, and actually, the Christmas Eve sell-off took us to the very bottom of our range in U.S. stocks. Uh, so June and her staff stepped up and actually started buying on, on uh, December 26 back into the market to make sure we held our, our ranges, which now is very fortuitous because January has actually been really positive. Um, and while we... We post at December 31, uh, you know, it was a negative 3.2% year for us net of fees. So you can use that as a comparison. Our members can to their 401ks or to their 403bs if they want to compare how they did versus us. The positive news I can tell you is, is we're, you know, today, I think today's the last day of January. Yeah. Uh, we're actually almost back to break even on the fiscal year to date. So that negative sell-off uh, in December was made back mostly in January. Uh, here's the uh, asset, or pardon me, the growth of the assets over this time period. We did hit an all-time record high back at the end of January at, at 230 billion. Uh, while we closed the year at, at just under 215 billion, we're actually back up to now back to 221 billion, bouncing around there. And then today, June mentioned, was an even more positive day. So. Uh, the portfolio is still sit, staying in that range of, of the mid-220s. Here's the asset allocation. Um, and it did change dramatically, particularly during December. Uh, you know, real estate, private equity don't move a heck of a lot because they're very long-term assets. So suddenly their slice of the portfolio grew dramatically. Um, but this is a better picture, I think, which is looking at it relative to our targets and our range. So you can see that at the end of December, we were still very low in global stocks. Um, and we were talking at lunch, if Nancy uh, Lazar is correct in that we do have a positive 12, 13% year, uh, we're then too underweight. And I'm sure that, that our tactical asset allocation committee, which we'll talk to you later in closed session, that's gonna be an active part of our debate. You know, Nancy is just one economic forecast. We get to hear from others. Uh, it's good to know the bullish story, but what's also the bearish story? So um, we took some profits in fixed income. So that portfolio was actually right on the mark. Uh, private equity and real estate. Real estate looks like the top of the range, and, and we've been trying to be a net seller of real estate and balance in that area. We're going to continue to. And then inflation sensitive, but RMS is what I would highlight. Um, Neil sent me an email this morning uh, highlighting RMS did perform positively in uh, the month of December. Um, it struggled a year to date. It, did, it didn't drop as much as equities did over, over 2018. It did add value. And we'll break it down for you later because the different components with RMS, two of them did well, one didn't do well. And I think it lends us back to our asset mix. If you remember with an RMS, we have four buckets two big ones, 45% and 40, and then two really small ones. And I think we want to look at what is the right balance within those buckets. Because we, you know, it's just one year, but we saw some different performance uh, values. PCA has 
four or five clients, I think, that have either crisis risk offset or uh, RMS type strategies, and, and PCA did a nice review of those for us. So uh, here's a picture of the USA down 5.2% on the year, again, all due to December. Notice the, just the overall shape of that busy chart of just kind of sideways action and a climb during the year and contrast it with this chart, which is the non-US. Um, never really reset a new high in August, didn't actually trade up at all, never went back to that January high, and it also stumbled in December, not as sharp as the US, but non-US down 13%. So it was a tougher year to be a global portfolio like we are. Here's the long-term numbers that I think you care about the most. Uh, the 30-year number, 8.2%. So as I said, that's net of fees, uh, beating our benchmark over those 30 years. Um, the 10-year number, the five-year number and the three-year number don't hit our actuarial goal. So our pace per mile is a little bit slower than what we want, but the three-year number is darn close. So six, nine, but again, that's only at the midway point in this year. We already made a lot of that ground up with the month of January. So. Um, you know, don't pay a lot of attention to the numbers at, at December 31. You're kind of looking at the halfway point in a race and, and you don't know how the rest of the race is going to go. But uh, we know some of our peers get reported and where their numbers are. And, and this will give you a comparison and a contrast. I don't have any other broad peer group data yet. That'll come out in the coming months and we'll have that for you in March. I do always want to back up and look at the stock market a longer period. Here it is back for five years to 2014. As you know, we can go all the way back to 2009 and show you in the prior periods that the market bottomed in March 9 of 2009 and has been rallying since. But we like to do technical analysis a lot. And a lot of people really say, oh, well, this bull market really only started in 16. If that's true, it did break it already uh, because of this sell off. Um, and also, you have to look, you can see that we've rallied back and now we have rallied through, now that we're into 2019, this kind of bottom line. Um, that was an important support line within the market if you want to get into technicals. So here's the chart all the way back to 2009. Um, we technically have held this 11-year-old bull market. Um, a lot of people look at the fact that we went back and touched the line, uh, but that'll be an important support is are we still in this multi, almost generational, but multi-decade bull market, or are we trading it? I think we're obviously more of a, a trading zone, but as Nancy said, she's much more optimistic and bullish where we would go back through those highs of uh, last January. But here's the graph I really want to draw attention to. Um, it's the yield curve. So the light blue line is June 30. The dark blue, thicker line is where we are at December 31. And you can see that the short-term rates climbed because the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates and they really only control the overnight rate. So that's gone up from two to two and a half. Long end really hasn't changed much so far in this fiscal year. It's the middle part of the year curve that's kind of the belly of the curve, as we call it, that's kind of flattened. You'll hear us talk a lot about how does that, is it a flat curve? As you can see, I think Don Rissmiller mentioned, you need the short end of the curve to rise all the way to 3% for this yield curve to be what we would consider flat. The reason they care or we care is that historically a flat yield curve or an inverted yield curve has signaled an upcoming recession. Not immediately, somewhere within six months to as much as 18 months later. I don't think it's going to get there, but the curve is certainly very, very flat. Uh, and it's interesting to note that long end because that affects the housing market. Where that 15 and 30 year rate goes really affects housing, which feeds into all their economic stats. So we'll watch that and I'll give you that on a periodic basis. Um, Alan Emkin already stole my thunder. I was gonna say today is, is uh, Fed Day. Um, that's uh, uh, Jay Powell. Um, we were hoping that it was gonna be steady as she goes and thankfully, the Fed actually came out, reaffirmed they're data dependent, which is not newsworthy, but they'll still make headlines, but they're going to be patient. Obviously, the markets love that word. I didn't, where did we close? Anybody know? Up, a percent and a half up in the market. So thank you, Jay Powell. Um, looking forward at the risks, um, you know, the market volatility, I think is still going to stay with us. A, a Fed surprise from Powell or, or a comment at a press conference or a, a speech any of the Federal Reserve gives is definitely going to be something that could shock this market. Obviously, the presidential tweets 
clearly it sounds like the Mueller report's coming out that may or may not impact the market. They may actually just not bother with it. Uh, the thing I really would focus you in on, I'll send you updates on, is Brexit. Um, the UK is still about the number two largest uh, market, or number three largest stock market. Uh, obviously, not the largest economy, but um, you know that is just turning out to be ugly. Uh, I think the most likely forecast is they will try and kick the can down the road. Uh, the EU will try and hold its ground and kick them out. Uh, we talked to some people in France this week, and their comment was that if there was a hard Brexit, you would see at least a, a three to a five hour wait line for trucks to go through the channel to, to bring goods and services. So just an absolute slowdown of delivery. And as I've always said, the UK will suddenly remind themselves that they actually are an island uh, and we'll see. So the rest of those are just uh, you know constant risks that we're keeping an eye on. Um, I like to highlight for the new board members We've created a category called Inevitable Surprises. Uh, credit actually goes back to Treasurer Lockyer, who referred us to that book. These are surprises that we know are going to happen in our lifetime, but when they happen, they'll be a surprise. Um, so, uh, you know, who knew? I remember the movie uh, Day After Tomorrow where they talked about polar vortexes. Now it's a common term of art, in our, and we're experiencing one, not us. Um, but, but Strymer, more extreme weather is going to be clear. Uh, I hate to knock on wood, bring up in California earthquakes, but Lord, we're overdue. Um, so who knows? Uh, Paul mentioned income inequality. I think social unrest. We've seen that with the yellow jackets in uh, uh, Paris and France. I think we're going to see that in other parts of the world. Uh, and then the other one I'd highlight, obviously, I, well, I don't even need to highlight it. Uh, I thought I was, when I put these slides together three weeks ago, I thought I was being presumptuous to bring up the 2020 election. Oh, nay, nay. Uh, now I'm like old news. Uh, so uh, I don't know if that'll uh, surprise the market, uh, but uh, Howard Schultz, I mean, Lord, who knows what's going to happen there. That's going to be uh, something that we'll watch. I don't know that it will be a threat to the economy or to the uh, markets per se, but uh, that certainly is going to generate a lot of headlines uh, in time. With that, I again, highlight the uh, slides that we have. There are a couple pages in the uh, CIO report I want to highlight for you, if you would give me a moment. Um, I would draw your attention to uh, INV83, um, where we have a chart of the globe. Um, I think it's important to note, again, that 75% of our portfolio is still in the USA. Uh, we have about 4%. 3.6 in Japan, uh, only 2.6 in the UK, but the UK and the pound does matter to us. We're about 2% in uh, Canada, and if you add it together, we're about 1.8% in China. So I think it's important. You've heard me say it before. Nancy highlighted China's the number two economy in the world right now. Some people predict it will become the number one economy in the world in a decade. Um, relative to our portfolio, we are considerably underweight. And it's an area I think we need to have a discussion about is should we be market weight or not? Uh, because history has not been kind. When one economy passes another, that's usually strife with conflict. Um, and obviously, China has an extremely different uh, uh, strategy than we do, governance and belief in human rights. Um, INV84 has your largest exposures. Uh, the one thing I think that's always interesting to note is, is Look at the diversification in the public equity space where the top 10 holdings don't even add up to 10%. And you'll notice Taiwan Semiconductor has crept on the list, so it shows that we're global. We are very much exposed to the, uh, uh, as I like to call them, uh, mana stocks. Um, people like to call them, uh, uh, now I'm drawing, forgetting the term because I use it so much, um, but the uh, Facebook phenomenon. Fang. 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 Thank you. See? Um, but obviously Google's not Google, it's Alphabet now. So, um, and then the, the manager concentration and the other portfolios. Um, then on uh, INV85, um, people, the board has asked sometimes about this chart. Uh, the easiest way I can think about to describe it is things that are in the green are on sale. Um, used to be able to say a white flower day, but I don't think the white carnation, they don't even do that anymore at Macy's, everything's on sale. But anyway, on sale, stuff that's in the red is overpriced. Don't know that term? All right. 
Um, oh, wait. So the green is an Amazon Prime Day? Yeah, there we go. Green's Amazon Prime Day. And red is, uh, oh, I'm dating myself yet again. Red is uh, very expensive. So that's an easy way to think of that chart and look at that. Uh, and then lastly, I highlight uh, 88 and 89. Um, this is actually December information, but we're going to keep you up to date on, on the major initiatives that we are doing in uh, corporate governance, which we're about to change the name. So with that, I'm open to any questions you might, might have. Well, I had you in the queue. You jumped, dropped out. You're fine. Okay. Dana? So, Chris, you just highlighted the, the handout, the value of CalSTRS engagements. Yes. And we've now added a reference section for some of the... I don't know. I, handouts or leave behinds or whatever you want to call them. Um, so like we can use this yeah. when we go to speaking events or somebody asks us a question that we have quick facts. Um, so I guess we probably should take a look at how often we will refresh those as things change. Yeah, the old one was on there. I didn't realize Chris had just refreshed it. If, if it's on. Is that brand new? Well, this, well, this is September. September. Yeah, oh, I thought this was the updated have, that's one. That's the one we have on the website then. The okay. September one? Yeah. So, so we like, will keep it updated. Our goal was every two months. Okay, every two months. I was thinking yep. maybe at least once a quarter. Or, and, oh, yeah. And as long as we know that, quarterly. we can quarterly. say that. I hear quarterly. quarterly. Okay. Quarterly. Quarterly works. Sorry. Quarterly. And it's hard with the cycle of the board meeting. Yes, no, that, that, that's fine. I just, as long as we know yeah, when we're sh sharing the information for someone. We can say that this is as of a quarter ago, and then we yep. can update ourselves by getting hold of you or yep. whatever. And then on the financial markets, so when we talked about the diversity of initiative, we talked about how many engagement letters we wrote, and then the results of those, how many uh, companies appointed women, how many women were appointed. But when we get down to the bottom on the financial markets and regulatory, Personally, I will be interested. I don't know if any of my colleagues are interested. Of If we wrote 18 letters, how successful were we in persuading those regulatory agencies to do what we wanted them to do? Okay. And you've always said that. You want more, uh, not just what we did, but what's the action, what's the result of what yeah. we did. So we'll give yeah. you more of the, I always like to say, the rest of the story. Wait. Let me ask, Paul Harvey, anybody? Bingo! I remember okay, that one. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Paul Harvey, the rest of the story. Oh my yeah, that was 100 years rest ago. I had hair story. back then. <laughs> Neil had hair back then. Because I've known Thanks, Neil Thanks, Chris. Long. I appreciate it. Very feisty you after lunch. I know. <laughs> it's like uh, trying to teach 12th grade government after lunch, man. It's like, just, oh, it's like stay focused it's, here. You know? All right, yes, sir. <laughs> Seriously. It's like everyone's talking and multiple conversations and chatter and Paul Harvey. I don't know, just sensitive. <laughs> Anything else, Dana? <laughs> Thank you. Chris, that's it? That's it. Okay. Um, as uh, we're moving to item seven, I, I neglected to acknowledge Mr. Rafino, who's a representative from Fiona Ma's office. Welcome to the board. We look forward to working with you, Mr. Rafino. Very much for being here. Item seven is the uh, is a very important information item. Uh, it's the annual cost report. I believe it's for 2017. We talk about the cost of running this portfolio, some peer comparison, and hopefully some ideas about how, as we're having uh, conversations about a collaborative model, should we move in that direction and actually execute on that plan we could actually drive down some of the costs associated with managing this large portfolio. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Smith, Deborah. Introduce the members of the team that provided us with this great report. Well, and I was going to jump in to introduce Deb, who, Deborah, who you know, who's your chief operating investment officer. Uh, but also highlight, you know, this is a, an evolving report. I just want to emphasize that. Uh, you've challenged us last year to add some features, which we've taken a, a step in the right direction to do. But again, it's just a step. We're not saying we're done yet, uh, which is to be able to produce gross and net numbers. The numbers you see are net all the time, but also to then add it back to show you what the gross return is. And this is at least one step of our effort to, to do that for you. So, Deborah? And I'm just confident there will be questions about the report, uh, but I want to let everyone know in advance, I'm, we're going to wait until the end of the presentation, and we'll take questions then. Deborah? Thank you. Good afternoon. So this is your CalSTRS investment cost report. 
And this is providing you information on how we manage the investment cost and how we monitor the cost. And it directly supports your investment belief three, that costs matter, that managing costs yields long-term benefits. So I'm just gonna step, step aside and kind of give a brief overview for some of the new board members. So we've been producing and presenting and creating this cost report for over 15 years. But previously, we had a CEM, which is cost-effective measurement rep, come and present to you. And about, I want to say four years ago, Mr. Rosenstiel and Ms. Hendricks asked staff to produce a more comprehensive report. Because that CEM, or cost-effective measurement report, was giving you some of the costs, but not all of the costs. It was limited in some of the private asset costs. So the, the board asked us, staff, we want you to present, and we want you to come up with a more comprehensive report. And in my opinion, CalSTRS is a leader in providing this comprehensive report because it's across all the in total portfolio. Some funds just do it for one or two asset classes, but we do it for the entire portfolio. So I'm proud of that. We started this about three years ago. So you'll hear a trend analysis. So we're setting the baseline, um, and we're going to give you the, the trend analysis. So we're starting to build that trend line. <coughs> Keep in mind, um, we, were, we normally present this in November. So this is the first time we're presenting it in January. So this is calendar year 2017 cost on a cash basis. In the next few weeks, we will start working on the 2018 calendar year cost, which hopefully will be presented to you in November. So take a step back. This is a team effort, and not just the team that's represented here at the panel, but also the leadership team behind me and the team that's on the 14th and 15th floor. Total team effort. And what staff did is we're like, OK, the board wants more comprehensive cost report. We need to contract with a consultant to help us gather those costs. And that consultant that we hired is called Pavilion. They're in the audience right now. And if I could have Raylan Lambert and Stephanie Perry to stand. Great. So the staff works with them to help us gather all of this private asset cost information to put in this report for you. I mentioned the CEM survey. We still participate in that. They don't no longer do they uh, present to you. But we continue to um, participate in that survey. And we give them data to put in their survey. And they come back with a peer comparison. And they say, is CalSTRS investment branch cost effective? If, are they cost effective in association with our peers? We go a step further with this comprehensive report, and you'll see how their methodology is different than ours. The last thing, and Chris mentioned a little bit, is we are being responsive to the board's request. Because the board asked us a couple, I don't know, a couple meetings ago, we want to see how this cost information measures up to our returns. And so we're going to produce, for the first time, a concept ratio concept, and I want you to be key on the concept piece, because there still needs a lot of work that needs to be done in this area. But we wanted to be responsive to the board's request of comparing costs to the returns. So with that, I would like to ask Neil or Steve if you have any questions before I sit, turn it over to the panel. No softball OK. <laughs> All right, I'll turn it over to April. All right, so I'm just going to run through the process to refresh you. It is the same process as last year, but just for new board members. Um, I'll just give you a brief update. As Deborah said, this is calendar year in basis, so it'll be as December 2017. It is cash basis. Um, it is a joint effort between pavilion and internal staff. So for the internal costs, CalSTR staff collect this data, but we outsource the private market data to pavilion. They perform over 50 validation checks per investment before and after uploading the data to their system. And then that data is um, 
it's reviewed and analyzed um, and put together across the entire year, both by Pavilion, Calster staff, and all the directors reviewing it as well. Um, the main way that they gather the data is by the partner's financial statements and also with the ILPA templates. So for those that aren't familiar, ILPA stands for um, Institutional Limited Partnership Association. And their main goal is to promote um, transparency and private equity and to help align interests between um, limited partners such as CalSTRS with the managers that they invest in. So for this report, um, we were able to use about 82% of the data from the ILPA template, which is an increase from last year. And it's actually really good because, I mean, the more that that template is utilized, the more we're setting standards um, across the industry. Um, I also want to point out that we were able to collect 98% of the private market net asset value. This is similar to last year, it is very high. And the remaining 2% are just residu residual balances from funds that are closed or uh, exited in. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention, I know Deborah talked about Pavilion, but subsequent to this report completion, um, Pavilion was acquired by Mercer. Um, you're not going to see any difference. Our team is going to remain the same. The process is going to remain the same. Just on the report you'll get later this year, it'll have Mercer's name in there instead of Pavilion. Okay, thanks, April. So before I show you and um, move into the numbers of the total costs of the portfolio, I want to kind of let you know that I'm so excited to be presenting these numbers to you today. I have been at conferences, talked to peers, talked to industry experts, and the more I talk to them, I am more convinced that we are actually the leaders in the cost reporting space, just to reiterate what Deborah said. So very excited to be presenting these numbers to you today. So on the screen, you have the total dollar costs of the portfolio. It's got the three years, calendar year 2015, 2016, and 2017. Um, costs have gone up. If you look at the very bottom row, uh, it's gone up from uh, $1.6 billion to roughly $1.8 billion. But so has the net asset value. Uh, net assets have increased from $186 billion to $218 billion over that time. Another way to look at the same information is in terms of basis points. Um, here you can see that costs really have been flat. To me, they look really flat over the three years um, in comparison to the growth in the assets. Now I want to bring your attention to the green bar, which represents costs with carried interest. Now for um, our newer board members, carried interest is the um, share of profits we pay to the uh, private equity managers. So that number, you really want to see it go high. It has a different implication. If it's higher, it just means that we have made more profit. So um, different from other types of costs. This is a comparison between internal versus external management costs. Um, you can easily tell that it's cheaper to manage investments internally we manage about 44% of the assets in-house, and they account for only 3% of the total costs. You're going to hear about the, this theme again probably later in the day when Margot uh, goes over the collaborative model, but um, we, we see this constantly. There are cost savings that can be achieved from managing assets internally. Same data, uh, a different cut. Uh, this time, you're looking at a comparison between private market costs versus public market costs. Now, uh, private markets are expensive, and uh, they do tend to have an, uh, a higher expected return in the long term. But um, again, for our new members, I would like to say that these markets are not accessible to any investor. Because CalSTRS, because of our sheer size, we cannot only access these markets, we're able to achieve uh, better fee breakpoints, we're able to achieve better deals uh, because of our size. 
With that, we move on to um, peer comparison. Hi. Um, so as Deborah mentioned, we partner with a third-party consultant um, for our cost measurement provider. That is um, short for CEM. And we've been working with them for at least 15 years. And uh, as we also mentioned, there's a little bit of a difference in methodology between what we provide and work with with CEM and what we use to provide you this comprehensive um, cost report. So the first uh, major differences is how they de derive that denominator, the assets under management or the net asset value. With uh, the service provider, they take the December 31st previous year end balance and then the current December 31st balance and average the two. And that's their denominator, denominator that they use to calculate the basis points. What we do for the cost report is we take the four quarters within the calendar year and smooth that out for um, our denominator. There's a little, there's some nuances to that when we take into account uh, funds that have closed or new funds that have started mid-year. Uh, we do a little more smoothing, um, but generally it's a four-quarter approach. The second uh, difference is that for the service provider, we only provide information up through, I'd like to direct you to uh, page IMV100 for this, this one. Um, if you look at IMV100, down at the bottom of that page on the grand total line, the cost information that, that the provider uses goes through management fees and the operating expenses. What we've provided to you in this report includes the other expenses. And for a definition of the other expenses, you've, you can see IMV 115. So I'd like to now draw your attention to the trend lines. So uh, the bottom line is CalSTRS over this five-year period. The middle line is our global peers. And then the top line is the US global peers that, or the US peers that we're compared to. <clears throat> so when you talk about global peers, we have, um, we're, our peer group is 14 different peer groups globally, and then out of those 14, we also are compared to um, the U.S. line. So the, the cost associated with the, the picture that I want you to take away from this is that um, our peer groups, the way they calculate the comparison on, on how, on the cost, is that this information is how much our peers would pay if they had the same asset mix that we have. So for 2017, um, CEM is calculated at 38.4 basis points for costs, and our global peers are 44.5. So that means that the global peers on average would have paid that much more in cost if they had our asset, asset mix. What that equates to is a 6.1 basis point savings, um, and that is uh, dollar-wise, that's $132 million that we've saved. I, I want to acknowledge uh, Paul. He's in the queue here. Paul, you have a question on Just this slide? Just a clarification. Yeah. So is the peer group, is the U.S. Peer group a subset of the peer group, so that so that the green is a subset of the red, or are those separate? I believe groups? they are a, a subset, but I can confirm that for you. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So so there, Calsters is based or benchmarked against a global peer. Okay. And so Melissa will clarify, but I believe that peer average, that red line, is the global peer, and then the U.S. and then the green line is just the U.S. peers. Okay. Thank you. But it's also, I think, it's U.S. peers of all kinds of size. 
right? Correct. So the peer group average is global. People are roughly in our size range. Oh, U.S. Right. is a bunch of other funds, too. Oh, okay. So they are... It's not that the U.S. operates at dramatically. It's just that that's kind of shows you the difference uh, of the cost savings of uh, hierarchy of, of size, scale? Yeah. the scale. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and Thanks, I also want to add that from the global peer groups um, shown on this line, the assets under management range from $79 billion through uh, $548 billion. So... If you look at this slide and you go back to the slide that Shafat was talking about, you'll see, wow, I thought they just told us that we were at 50 basis points in cost. And this one says 38.4 basis points. And so Melissa went over the methodology difference. CEM gives you a limited view. I would say a 75% view of the cost for all their pairs, so all of their clients present all of this data, they analyze it, and they compare all the, their clients against each other and come up with this peer comparison. But they're not able to capture all the private asset cost. So they give you a 75% solution, but this comprehensive cost report gives you a 98%. OK, moving on to the final piece of this presentation, um, the capture ratio analysis. And um, what we have here is a capture ratio analysis, uh, which kind of compares uh, and contrasts how the returns look compared to the costs we have collected over the three years. So just to backtrack a little bit, what is capture ratio? I think we're all familiar with the concept of uh, flipping a house. You buy a property at one price, and you sell it at another price, and hopefully you make a profit. That's your gross return. From that gross return, you pay real estate commissions, and you're left with a little lesser profit, which is your net return. So capture ratio is basically how much profit you made in gross and how, and how much you actually kept at the end of the transaction. So taking that back to the CalSTRS portfolio, it is the uh, ratio between the net returns and the gross returns, and basically showing us how much of the profits we kept and how much of it we paid out to investment managers as fees. Now, um, in the green box up there is the capture ratio. And as Chris said, this is still work in progress and it's not complete. Um, there are challenges, and I would like to, I think there are more hurdles because I think they can be overcome. One of the biggest hurdles is uh, the time frame. We only have three years of cost, comprehensive costs. And while it might be um, meaningful for the public asset classes, for private equity and real estate, three years is a very short time frame. So please look at the numbers with an open mind. Um, the second hurdle is a little <coughs> bit technical. I think um, we need to set some definitions around the inputs of the calculation. And then lastly, for 2015, 16, and 17, we have been in a positive returns environment. And so it was pretty straightforward to put the capture ratio together for you. But in the event of when returns are negative, it will get a little tricky. So I look forward to working with your consultants and our cost reporting consultant to uh, make this a better product and present it to you in the future. But having said all this, I want to leave you with one takeaway. I think this has got a lot of potential. And um, thanks to your thought leadership, we endeavor on this journey. And we have crossed the, I mean, we are way ahead of, um, of the industry. And right now, we've taken the cost report, which used to be an informational item, to information which is useful. So I'm um, very excited to be part of the process and look forward to the work ahead. Thank you, Siobhan. And this report not only shows you how we manage and monitor costs, staff is looking at this data as we continue to research the collaborative model. So we're looking to bring more assets in-house, and we're seeing, okay, where are our opportunities where we can lower the costs 
And as you've heard, we're looking at private equity, real estate, and some of our private private asset classes. A couple of uh, people have questions or comments. More than a couple now. <laughs> good. It's a good report. Um, and I, Shifat, is it Shifat? I thought your example of explaining capture ratio and the example that you used was um, exceptional. It was mm -hmm. so you simplified that concept and made it very understandable for someone like myself. So thank you. Sharon. <laughs> well, then my question is going to be a little embarrassing because, uh, <laughs> and I, I first of all, I just want to acknowledge it's so cool to see four women <laughs> in front of me at this board. I don't, it's been a while. And so it's just, I want to acknowledge our staff and Chris, and it's just, it's cool to see this and to see that reflected in the staff of our investment team. So just want to acknowledge that. Um, and Shafa, I need help, I guess, because I'm not as smart as Harry. And so I need, I, I did think, I, I follow your analogy um, of the flipping the house, but I, I just need a little more help with kind of translating what this says to us about cost. So would you be able to help just kind of, when we look at the capture ratio, total portfolio, what is the 92.9, what does that actually mean in re, in layman's terms for us, in terms of the cost savings for us? Sure. I'm, so again, I, I think it becomes a little bit technical, so I didn't want to go into too much detail, I, and, but I and, will try. Right, if you can translate <laughs> technical into- Absolutely. <laughs> not technical. Sure. So. When we make investments, we make returns. And from those returns, we have to pay the managers, our partners. So the returns we make is our gross returns. Yeah. right? And then after we've paid all the fees to the managers, we're left with something that we the call the, the net return. Right. So the ratio, the capture ratio is basically an equation. It's the net returns divided by the gross returns. Okay. And you just get to see how much of your total profits you got to keep. How and much bring you back capture. Into how yes. much we captured. We yeah. captured that. Right. Let me, I'll just add on. Yeah. Sorry, Deb. The, okay. For every dollar of profit, like in public uh, total portfolio, we got 93, 93 cents, cents of every dollar of profit. It. That works. doesn't tell you how much return you get. Obviously, you get a lower return in some asset classes, a higher, but it tells you what percent of the profit you're capturing yourself. That's a good number. Okay. So it also shows you which asset classes are really inexpensive and which are expensive. And then I think I heard you say, Deborah, that moving forward, we're going to get a better sense of the value we get for the cost savings? Is that, that's kind of? Yes, yeah, so we're gonna use, you know, we have three years of data, so we're building that trend line, and we're gonna continue to produce that report, this report, build that trend line, and use this data to see how we can continue to lower costs. That's particularly great. as we go down and review and implement, perhaps, the collaborative model. Because I think even when, when Mr. Rosenstiel and I talked about this years ago, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's about reducing fees, but it's, it's really more about, you know, getting value for the fees that we pay for. Yep. So it's not just lowering the number. It's actually whatever we pay, we should get value from that. And, and so I think that piece of, of being able to see the value we're getting from the costs that we're paying is really a critical piece, I think, for for us as trustees. So Absolutely. I applaud all your work and I'm looking forward to um, continuing to refine this report to give us more information. So Thank you. Thanks. May I ask a related question? Mm -hmm. Does the, do the private markets include carried interest here or not? No, they do not. No. And I think We've looked at um, what is the definitions, and that's something we would like to refine going down is, you know, define the inputs, what makes more sense. Oh, it doesn't. It does not include. That's correct. It does not include the carried interest. Dana? So I'm, I'm, from your explanation of the carried ratio, capture ratio, I, I too followed. <laughs> I'm not as good as Harry either. I followed your analogy. I, and I think it was a perfect analogy, and I probably watched Flipper flip Flop way too much. And and and, and when Which they have they, they have what they sell it for and what they've invested in it, and then what they put as their profit doesn't subtract out what they've invested in it. So they don't make half as much as what they say they do. Um, but your your <laughs> explanation after to Sharon's really helped me, and I don't know why I didn't make that leap because it's really pretty simple, and so. 
thanks for talking it out a little bit more with us. Um, I have three questions, Harry, and I don't know if you want me to ans ask them all at once or. Um, I, I'm, Dana, will you just bear with me for one moment? Please? Absolutely. Can you pull up slide uh, number four, please? Because I, I, I'm sensing that there's, uh, it was mentioned that does not include carried interest, but then there was this slide that showed the carried interest. So there's a sense of confusion, I think, amongst committee members and so help us on, and, and folks in the back there. Sure, so this is just part of the cost report. We have broken out the total cost, which is the blue bar, right. and we have the green bar that shows total cost plus carried interest. And I can't explain what carried interest is. It has a different implication. You want to see more of it. But in the capture ratio, which is work still in progress, the costs do not include carried interest. It's, in the captured ratio? Yes, Okay. in this table. And it's a work in progress, and it's a new endeavor, and you're optimistic that it has potential over time that you'd be able to cap, to be able to demonstrate that for us. Right. Is that, okay. All right. Dana. Yeah, because it's kind of hard to, if carried interest is the split of the profit, yeah. it's hard to, it's a split of the profit. It's not necessarily, a co I mean, it's, it's not a cost, like a fee, right. so it's a kind of a different, it's a bird of a different feather, so I, I totally understand why you don't have that in the case. Yes, and this, these are the things we think about as we prepare <laughs> this, is what do we do, and so, again, yeah, yeah, yeah. we need okay. to put a lot of thought to, to this. Um, Neil had Is it on this a point, reaction Neil? to my, to my okay. comment, so, yes, there you go. It sort of just boils down to what is the gross return coming out of your private markets? What's right. the true gross return coming out of there? So that, and that's something, like you said, will be resolved in the future. All right. Go ahead. I'm going to go off yeah, on a whole different tangent. You ready? That's great. We're ready for that. <laughs> so, all righty. Um, when we were talking about, um, I'm on uh, IMV 93, when we were talking about, there's a, there's a paragraph underneath uh, Table 1, and it talks about the fee rates in the first, for first few years are typically based on committed capital, rather than contributed capital. And then there's parentheses behind that, which is smaller in the initial years. In reading that, it makes me think that there's a point somewhere within the life of that investment that that flips, that then we are paying more fees on what has actually been contributed than what's committed, what we have left to, for them to draw down on. About where does that flip? Margo grabbed the mic, but we're going to say generally it's about uh, year four and five. Uh, partnerships, private equity particularly, have an investment horizon. Uh, they get paid, whether it's capital called or not, they get paid a management fee during the investment period, and then it steps down right away once it becomes companies. Um, here, Margo. And then real estate's a different time period. Here, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I heard that right, but it, uh, partnerships are going to be more expensive in the earlier years. And so if you have a program like ours where you've had an increase in the investment pace, you're going to have an increase in the investment fee load. Okay. Thank you. And Chris, when you say that's year four or five, is that like with a 10-year? Would you agree with that? So it's like halfway through? The investment period, they typically step down. That's after four or five years out of typically 12 to 15 years. Okay. So, the first third, so it's not necessarily halfway. You would expect it to okay. be more. Thank you. And particularly in the first couple of years, because you're not you're not getting any money out, but you're paying a full fee load. So it it's not it's not a discreet. It it it'll taper down throughout the whole life. Got it. Thank you. And then um, oh, I didn't jump to it on. Well, maybe it did jump to it. Hang on. This is about the role of carried interest internally. So on IMV 94, um, that the internally managed investments represent 44% of the total portfolio, portfolio 
only 3% of the total costs, excluding the carried interest. So it's the same type of deal as the capture ratio. We wouldn't include that because it's the carried interest. But do we have carried interest on our own internal, internally managed? Because yes. we have co-partners that then would it's, get to get carried it's, interest? No, it's called your incentive. Uh, your, your incentive plan you pay us as, as a staff. I would call that our carried interest. That's our our incentive because we call it carried interest in the private markets but we call it performance fees or incentive fees in the public markets and, and that's the same thing you pay the staff an incentive fee in our case the the incentive compensation i would you know it's not pure carried interest like that but it's uh you pay that over three years for you're incentivized us or the external managers to outperform Okay, I guess I was looking at it like it's instead of carried interest for us, it's profit. And, the same thing. And then, and carried then interest did, is a split of the is profit okay. sharing. Prof okay, that that same thing sense. whether it's public markets right. or private, uh, in internal or external, you're splitting the profits. And internally, that doesn't necessarily um, match the incentives that are paid out. It's no, it does. Okay. Uh, you know, when then you think about the incentives over over. 80% of the incentives you pay staff are linked directly to performance to measures performance. That's true. Uh, okay. that are uh, total fund benchmarks or asset class benchmarks. Only 20% is a personal thing. So I, I, I equate, I would, I think it's fair to equate the incentive program to profit sharing. Okay. Thank you, Chris. And then um, my last question is, when we talked about this, there right now is not... Uh, a standardized tool to measure what we're trying to measure. And I think more people or more uh, systems are trying to capture this information. So we're involved in SASB trying to develop the sustainable uh, standards. So there's a uniform reporting. Is there any type of movement in the cost measurement field that they're trying to develop something that's standardized? And are we part of that, if there is? I'll let the ladies think about it while they respond. Um, and April and Deb have been to several of these meetings. Um, we're, we're, the first thing we're trying to do is get people to report it so we don't have to hire a consultant and extract right. it. Um, and that's templates and, and standardized reporting. So we're getting that slowly. The ILPA adopted it in private equity, but it's been slow uptake, frankly. And I've gone to... Asia to pump it up, and we've tried to talk about it, but we're, we're getting it from larger firms, but not obviously the smaller ones. Real estate's heading toward a common uh, reporting format, thankfully, but a lot of the stuff is still, it's basically still manual. It's not digital yet. And, and I think, Dana, once we get digital, then you can start to see more enhanced uh, reporting. I'm sure you'll start to see cost consultants come out and be able to talk about it. Uh, but right now, it's such a hand-powered calculation. That's why most of our peers only try and do this on private equity. You know, we're, we're not trying to just toot our own right. horn. It's very few people are trying to do this across their entire portfolio. It's hard enough just in one place. Right. And I said, we're going to do it right. So we're trying to do it everywhere. So April, Deb. Yeah, the only thing I wanted to add is um, CalSTRS is part of a global leaders where we meet annually with a lot of top pension funds and investors across the globe where we talk about um, costs and how to standardize them, what are we going to research for the next year. So that is like a very important thing that we are involved in. Super, thank you. That's right. it for me. And that, and that right. Global Leaders is part of that CEM, that Cost Effective Measurement Organization. Can you rattle off some of the other peers that you respect? Um, that, that I respect? <laughs> <laughs> Well, 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 you have you have a moment to think about that, Deborah. <laughs> While you do, uh, we're going to turn it to uh, uh, State Controller uh, Betty Yee. <laughs> Thanks, Harry. Uh, first, I want to just we're thank you. We're in public for, session. Uh, I want to thank you for the comprehensiveness of this report. It's really um, it's really a stellar um, body of work, and I think an important building block when we um, proceed into the collaborative model presentation as well. And because uh, um, I can say that um, my experience in other settings have really kind of put the cost issue as an afterthought. 
and this is just really front and center uh, in front of us, which I appreciate. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is um, you talked about um, just next steps, and I was wondering if um, the next steps, I mean, obviously some low-hanging fruit here and then some, but is it really to focus on what we can bring in internally um, as next step? So next steps is we're going to continue to produce the report. Uh -huh. We want to make it useful information to you on how we manage and monitor the cost. So the next steps for the staff is to work with the consultants in refining this capture ratio analysis. Because this report is calendar year, mm -hmm. and the information that the board, or excuse me, the investment consultants provide you on a semi-annual basis on a, is on a fiscal year basis. So we need to align those two. Okay. So that, that would be the next steps. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I think from a business perspective, yeah. this affirms what I think we already well knew, which is partnerships are darn expensive. Mm -hmm. um, they make up the vast majority of private equity, a chunk of inflation sensitive and, and even in real estate. That's part of the collaborative model of looking for other ways beyond partnerships to do this, yeah. potentially at lower costs with more control. If we can't get the same return, then we shouldn't be doing it. Right. But that's why we always want to drive back to what's our net, but what's it costing us to get that net, and are there better ways to, to capture that return? Mm -hmm. So that is definitely part of our discussion, and that's why it f flows into all the collaborative model discussions you've heard is the idea of moving beyond partnerships mm -hmm. and improving that ratio. Yeah, good. Okay. And then um, something we haven't mentioned, but certainly that this um, – committee spent a lot of time working on that was the uh, risk mitigation strategy asset class and uh, um, the decline in fees over the period of time covered here. I mean, is that, like, do you believe that will be a continuing trend and what were the factors that contributed to that from your perspective? Oh. I'll, 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 I'll respond sure. while Stephen is coming up. Um, so Stephen's team has done a really good job of negotiating fees yeah. for new and existing managers, and I'm sure he'll continue to do that, um, as well as uh, lower costs for the RMS um, asset class is driven by an increase in size to one of our strategies, and that's why you see a lower cost for RMS as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, at the inception of the RMS program, we started out with um, transferring some of the strategies from the innovation program, and they were the global macro as well as the trend following. So when we, when we reported the costs, it was on those two strategies only. But over time, as you well know, there's four separate strategies. So the, the, um, the U.S. or the long duration component is managed internally, and there's no, um, the cost is really the internal cost here, which is very low. So as the two largest components within the RMS are trend following is 45%, which is the largest, and then the long duration is 40%. So that's where the bulk of the cost is. So once we brought in the, the long duration, that really brought the cost down. Mm -hmm. So what we expect over time, though, is that the cost that you see now should go down slightly because uh -huh. we're still implementing the program. But what we hope to see over the long term, it will probably stay, stay around 100 basis points. That's great. Really great progress. Thank you. Uh, another factor that I'll just mention is that uh, one of the things that we said that when we implemented the program is that we would renegotiate the fees with the existing managers that we had in the program. And so um, the idea was that with the trend following managers is that we would, um, we would give them a larger allocation. But what we did was when we made that um, allocation, we said that essentially that you had to lower your fees, and so we're able to achieve part of the savings there. That's great. Good. Thank you. 